Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it in abundance. Everyone who's ever heard the story of Jesus of Nazareth knows about the little town of Cana in Galilee. They may not be able to point to it on a map, but they do know that Jesus went there to attend a wedding celebration and that during his visit, he's reported to have turned water into wine. Unfortunately, this has become one of the most misunderstood stories in the entire gospel because of those who insist on treating it as though it were the report of an actual historical event. But it wasn't meant to be understood like that at all. In order to fully appreciate this passage, we need to remember that the best Jewish teachers have always loved to tell stories as a way of explaining a profoundly important idea. Again and again and again, they've begun to answer a difficult question with the words, there's the story of a man. Often these tales have been filled with such vivid characters and such lively events that they eventually passed into their religious tradition sounding like a scrap of authentic history. The gospel writer John obviously belonged to this Jewish storytelling tradition. And there are passages in his narrative which are so rich and so real that it would be easy to imagine them as a fragment of something that had actually taken place during the Galilean ministry. But in fact, they were never meant to be taken as scraps of history. Instead, they were meant to be a signpost pointing us to a deeper understanding of our faith. And that's important to remember because if this Cana story was the account of an actual moment in the ministry of Jesus, we would be well within our rights to ask why no one in the early church had the good sense to have it struck from the gospel record. Because if Jesus really did turn all that water into wine, then what we have here is nothing less than an acute embarrassment. Let's look at the facts that we're given in this story, and you'll see what I mean. Jesus was invited to attend a wedding reception. One of the marks of any Jewish marriage in the ancient world was its lavish hospitality, including an abundance of wine. So if Jesus got there to find all the wine nearly gone, he was arriving at a party where the guests had already been living high off the hog. Yet faced with this situation, he went ahead and contributed to their overindulgence. Because if you take this story quite literally, Jesus provided that party with an additional 180 gallons of new wine. But there's more. For we're faced here with another and even greater embarrassment because it not only makes Jesus look like some sort of music hall magician, but it means that this is quite different to any other miracle he ever performed. When he healed a leper or restored sight to a blind man, he was responding to a desperate human need. But like a wine at a wedding feast, especially when the guests had already been heartily indulging themselves, could hardly be described as a human crisis crying out to be addressed. A few years ago, a man called Strauss produced the study of Jesus in which he criticized the Cana incident as a miracle of sheer luxury. And certainly, if you take John's story quite literally, Strauss was justified in his blunt condemnation. But the fact is that John never meant us to read the story of Cana as a piece of history. Instead, he describes the whole incident as a semelon, the Greek word for a sign, which means that this was his way of telling us that the story is meant to be understood as a sort of parable pointing us towards some important things we need to know about the Galilean. And the first 
semelon, or sign, to which he points, is the humanity of Jesus. Perhaps one of the reasons for the popularity of this story is that we respond to the idea of the master accepting an invitation to attend a wedding reception. It signals the fact that we can arrange our own parties and enjoy them with a good conscience because it means that this Jesus of Nazareth was no killjoy. It's significant that John's is the only gospel to include an account of Cana. His was the last to be written, some 70 years after the crucifixion, and at a time when the church had to deal with a new theology called Gnosticism. And the church felt alarmed by the spread of Gnosticism because one of its claims was that Jesus wasn't actually made of flesh and blood. Oh, he appeared to be a man, but he was in fact a divine being who was disguised in human form. They said, for example, that when he walked along the seashore, he left no footprints in the sand. The church was deeply concerned about this new theology because, among other things, it played havoc with the message of the cross. It means that everything about those last painful hours was really nothing more than a charade because if Jesus wasn't truly human, then all that suffering at Calvary amounted to little more than make-believe. So again and again, John's gospel questions the claims made by the Gnostics by highlighting the humanity of Jesus. It's why his narrative is filled with accounts of a hungry Jesus and a thirsty Jesus, of a Jesus who was dog-tired and who wept over the grave of a friend. And in this Cana story, he's once again providing us with a sketch of a man who was so human, so approachable, that he was invited to share in all the fun and merrymaking of a Jewish marriage. Compare that with those who imagine that religion should be a gloomy and depressing affair, because that's certainly not the Christianity you find in the pages of the New Testament. Instead, we find Jesus lightening the dawning of God's kingdom to a raucous party that's being thrown by our Heavenly Father. That then is the first semelon or sign that we find coming out of Cana. It points to the sheer humanity of Jesus and reminds us that we should never allow the joy of our own celebrations to be inhibited by a religion that's dark and dismal. But the second semelon to which John points is the compassion of our Lord. At a Jewish wedding reception, it was the responsibility of the bride's father to provide an abundance of everything his guests might want or need. It would therefore have been a matter of consternation for him to have learned that the thirst of his guests had far outstripped his supply of wine. So Cana is painting the picture of a Jesus who performed a caring act which saved a Galilean family from shame and humiliation. There is a kind of maliciousness that takes delight in making a good story out of the plight of others, a, a spitefulness that enjoys the embarrassments that befall our neighbors. And the simple sign that blazes forth from Cana is that our Lord was so deeply concerned about saving a family's reputation that he turned their poverty into plenty. Now, I know there's no question that compared with the plight of the blind and the lame, the difficulties that had arisen at this wedding party were relatively trivial. But John's story is pointing to the fact that the compassion of Jesus extends beyond our spiritual needs to all those other domestic moments that make up our everyday lives. It means that Christ is not only Lord over the bread and wine of the sacramental meals we share in worship, but that he also reigns over all those other occasions 
when bread is broken at a family dinner table. It means that he is with us not only when we're at prayer, but while we're at work or enjoying one of our hobbies. Not only when we're in church, but while we're relaxing with our friends or attending our favorite entertainments. So what we have here is an account of John teaching us about our Lord's humanity and, in addition, about his compassion. But the third and most important semelon coming out of Cana is the spiritual significance of the Christ. Let's look again at the story and see if we can find any signs which will better help us understand the importance and significance of Christ's coming into this world of ours. And when we do, we find that soon after Jesus arrived at the reception, it was discovered that all the old wine was gone. But the master made an abundance of new wine, and the general consensus was that the best had been saved for last. What, in fact, John is doing here is looking back to the old Israel and saying that while there is no question that it had provided men and women with a good wine in centuries past, by the time the word was made flesh and lived among us, all the resources of that old wine had dried up. The devotion of the Psalms had given way to a religion of legalism, and the seething cry of the prophets had been silent for almost two generations. And into this spiritual bankruptcy... Jesus brought new wine. And not only was it better than anything else the human race had ever tasted before, but it was being shared with unprecedented generosity. In a sense, this story is a commentary on our Lord's promise that he had come into the world that we might have new life and might have it in abundance. Do you see now what I meant when I said that Cana was never intended to be taken as a scrap of history, but rather it should be read as a sign which John used to remind us of Jesus Christ, who can take all that is dried and desiccated in a religion and infuse it with a new life that is not only new, but abounds in its abundant generosity. It's what Paul meant in that letter to the Ephesians when he talked about the differences between living under the old law and living under the new grace which God is willing to extend to us. But the tragedy is that there are still so many of us who are living under the barrenness of the old law, still equating discipleship with measuring up to an impossible standard. And when we can't reach that standard, we either abandon Christianity altogether dismissing it as an impossible dream, or we reduce its vision to a nice, respectable way of living, which is comfortably manageable. And in the process, we drain all the joy out of our faith. We we become a people with plenty of water, but with no wine. What a contrast when we choose instead to embrace the promise we hear coming out of Cana. It's the incredible news that Jesus Christ has come into the world to offer us much more than a decent respectability or a conventionally accommodating religion, but has come that we might have a faith that is vibrant and joyful. He has come that we might revel in its newness and rejoice in its sheer generosity. It's what he meant when he said, I have come that they might have life and have it in abundance. Amen and thanks be to God.